As we remain standing, let's just take a moment reflecting on what we have just declared to God. Lord, I need you. How I need you. What is it as we begin our gathering tonight that you need from the Lord? What are you reaching out? What am I reaching out to him for? In silence, just pray in your own heart, what would you want from the Lord? What are you seeking? Lord, you hear the unspoken desires of our hearts, what we need from you, where we need cleansing where we need that experience of forgiveness for the first time to receive your mercy, where we need to be unshackled from the, the shame or the guilt that we're carrying, which you've already spoken forgiveness over, where you need you in the, the illnesses or the pains in our body, where we need you in the relationships that we're in. Where we need you in that difficulty in our workplace. Where we need you in simply guidance for the next step. Where we need you because we just long to grow in you and to taste that you are good. Where we need you so that we can tell others of your goodness and your grace. Lord, how we need you. Let's sing that verse again, but rather than singing how I need you, let's sing together how we need you. Lord, we need you. We need you, Lord. Every hour we need you. You're our defence and our righteousness. Oh God, how we need you. 
Let's sing it through one more time. Did you confident he's heard that prayer tonight. So let's anticipate. Do grab a seat. Uh, my name's Jackie. I, uh, I'm actually going to be leading through the service today and speaking just because somebody's back in the States rather than being here. So it's a little bit difficult to do both of those things. So a very warm welcome to you. Isn't it great? The sun's back out. Woo-hoo. And as a result of being, well, not just because the sun's back out, but because we're kind of at that point in the year. We're about to finish a series. We're going to start a new one. Some people are coming back for their holidays because uh, their terms are finished. Some people are... Who's on holiday, Hannah? Woo! Some teachers have broken up already for the summer. Uh, so we thought it would be a good time to do kind of ice cream and cake after the service. Woo! So... We're going to enjoy our trust and fellowship, we're going to pray, we're going to sing, we're going to learn, and then as a community, we're going to eat ice cream and cake together. So that's where we're going in the course of the evening. Uh, I'm going to give you a few uh, notices, a few opportunities for the coming uh, days, and whilst I'm doing that, uh, David, just David, David is going to bring an uh, offering bag and the card machine around. This is for regulars to give to the life. Uh, of the church. If you're not a regular with us, you just pass it by. And the little card machine, you can change the number. If you look at it and go, wow, that's a lot of zeros. I'm not giving that much. Just change it. Give what you can. Um, If you are new with us, uh, David and Rachel at the end will be kind of loitering by the welcome desk at the back. Do fill in a connect card uh, so that we can be in touch with you. You get some information about uh, the church. Uh, A few things for... uh, really about the week ahead. Uh, please be praying tomorrow. Hazel Deacon's funeral occurs at two o'clock uh, in here, possibly not known to uh, many of you, but um, pray for her family. She's a long-term member of the church as they gather with others uh, to celebrate, uh, celebrate Hazel's uh, life. Um, next Sunday, lots of things happening. 28th of uh, July, if you are a church member... I realise you're normally probably coming to this service, but if you could come along at 12.30, that would be much appreciated. We have an opportunity uh, to discuss and vote on a resolution that we need to purchase uh, number 231 Kings Road. We're almost there, uh, but we need a church meeting to pass some final resolutions. So please come 12.30 next Sunday if you are a member here in the Kings Room uh, so we can get that resolution Uh, discussed and voted on. Then there's something else happening this weekend, I think. Something else happening? Anybody going away? There's a little bit of a youth camp happening. Um, And for those of us who go, youth camp, what youth camp? It's a long time since I went on youth camp. Uh, You can be involved. You can be part of it. Uh, So that nobody misses out, uh, leaders contribute towards the camp as well. It's not just a holiday for them, as well as giving up some of their annual leave. Um, But actually, there's an opportunity to give us what we call a hardship fund. And at the moment, there's almost a 1K deficit on that because of the needs. So there's an opportunity for any of us who are in the position to be able to give to enable us to make youth camp happen and people to be able to go. And there's a QR code in faith, she says, somewhere over her shoulder. And for those of you that get Wycliffe Weekly, there's also a notice in that. And you just need to reference the gift YC, YC gift, and thank you for doing that. You do, and we're going to come back to youth camp in a moment. Be prepared. You might be asking you a couple of questions off the but spontaneous tonight. Be uh, And then uh, some of you who come regularly will realise that food share occurs uh, tonight as well as Thursday and Saturday nights. Uh, lots of people queuing to pick up food. Opportunity to talk with them, pray with them sometimes in that, and so volunteers are needed. Um, So if you're interested in exploring 
being on the rotor for that, please speak to... Paul's on holiday, so you can't speak to Paul tonight. Come talk to me. Catherine's about to go on holiday, so you can't speak to Catherine either. So speak to me or email the office. And if you are interested in joining our superbly gifted and wonderfully humble, generous, hardworking tech team... I should say, Ollie is not the only member of the tech team for the six o'clock service. David and SJ uh, also serve uh, really frequently. But somebody's going off to university. Uh, we hope, we trust, in faith, she announces. Um, we're doing some training at the moment for other people to be able to join that. I think there was some training yesterday. Anger, oh, you went as well? So, uh, Anna was there as well. There's another session next week. But if you're interested in joining the team, then do come and have a chat. We'll point you in the direct, right direction. And um, be great to have people using their interests and gifts in that way. Brilliant. Well, uh, I hadn't really planned this until I was kind of walking in earlier and thought, there'll be people in the congregation. This is our congregation, six o'clock congregation. There'll be people this time next week who will be basking in sunshine under canvas which would be so much different to the junior camp that went away and managed not to float away, I think, because it was so uh, wet. So if you are going on camp as a participant, do you want to wave your hand? So turn around now, have a good nose, see who's going around. So see some of our participants. If you are going on camp as a helper, leader, cook, something, right, have a look around. There's a few of them. Around as well. We're going to be praying for these guys in a moment. So, Pete, do you want to come up for a moment? Yeah. Tell us how we can be praying. Well, tell us what Youth Camp is, because there are some new folks here. Who's it for? What's the aim? And then. It's Camp for Youth. <laughs> and hey. Is it under canvas? It is under proper canvas. Camping? Yeah, it's true. It's under canvas, proper camping. We do have a big old barn as well. It's kind of cheating. It's made of wood, not canvas. Um, it's a lovely week away. I would say arguably the greatest week away of the year. Am I right, youth? <laughs> if they all went, no. Nah. That's 10 pounds <laughs> off your bill. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pay you later. Um, it's incredible. It's a week of activities, of amazing food, of kind of insane traditions that are older than me. I know it's hard to believe. And just things that have been going on for years that... Even the leaders don't even understand what's going on, but we love it. Um, of times of meeting together and meeting with God, uh, the, the kind of worship and prayer and kind of talks that we received, are just, they're just off the chain every single year. I'm super excited to see what God's going to do in and around the young people. Um, yeah, it's just so much to be excited for. So what's the topic this year? The theme of the activities is pirate camp. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and... The theme of the chaplaincy, we're going to look at through the story of Ezekiel, the person of Ezekiel. That well-known pirate. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Elijah. So, oh, wait. Elijah. <laughs> Sorry, I got the E's wrong. Elijah. I know what I'm talking about. It's okay. not like I'm giving one of the talks. Rewind that. Rewind. <laughs> what is the theme this year? What are yeah, you oh, looking at? I'm glad you asked. Chaplaincy theme really is <laughs> Elijah. I was about to say Ezekiel again. It's Elijah, not Elisha. Elijah. <laughs> It's going to be amazing. We're going to receive a lot the from teaching? the Bible. I'm going to do some of the teaching, okay. but I'm right at the end, so I'll, I'll get the name right by the end of the week, hopefully. Um, things to pray for. The weather. It's looking a little dicey. It could go either way, so we don't want a repeat of kids' camp. We don't want wet tents on the back down. Um, pray that people will not just receive knowledge and information, but there would be formation, transformation, that people would meet with the real living Jesus. Amen. Yeah, yeah, we want, we want some of that. Young people and leaders meeting with real Jesus. Um, and also just safety, peace, joy on the camp. There's so much that could go wrong. <laughs> he says as he does his risk assessments this week. Um, just prayer, <laughs> prayer that everyone is happy and wholesome and healthy. Yeah. Great. So that's year seven to 13? Sevens to 13s, yeah. Brilliant. Something happening at the end of the summer for a f those that are a bit younger. So I'm going to get rid of you. Ooh. I say, Alison, come and join me. What happens for those who are a little bit younger? Um, if you're um, between 5 and 11, you can come to our Holiday Bible Club, which is between the 27th of August and the 30th of August. Farm, four mornings, 
from 9.30 till 11.30. And Elijah or Ezekiel are not turning up to yours either? They're not coming to us. So what's your ours? theme this year? Ours is, it's called Shine. It's going to be set in space. Mm -hmm. um, and our teaching theme is Light. So we're looking at light through the Bible from creation to heaven. Excellent. So how can we pray for you this evening? Um, pray for the practicalities of getting it all ready and finished and ready to go. Um, and just that all the right people come in. And again, that the children meet Jesus while they're here um, and we have a really awesome time and um, yeah it's really again transformative for the children and lots of young people serve so it's really good training for them it's a real training ground as well for our young people brilliant thank you very much we're going to pray and uh, what we're going to do is just turn it to some small groups uh, now one of our six o'clock traditions is if you're not used to praying aloud or you're uncomfortable praying aloud then simply Fold your arms, and that means nobody expects you to be joining in a small group. Doesn't matter which way your arms go over, left over, right, right over, left out, just fold your arms and lean back and nobody. But turn your chairs around. If you're in a group where you don't know somebody, do introduce yourself first. But you've literally got three or four minutes to pray for some of those things that have just been mentioned, because we were leaving a powerful God. So let's pray. if you'd like to draw your prayers to a close, as they say. And whilst the last few people are finishing their prayers, if you'd like a Bible, uh, please do put your hands in the air so we can give out some Bibles. Uh, we're going to be looking at 2 Samuel 22. But we're going to kind of read it as we go through. So uh, if you find page 328, leave it propped open. Um, 
we're kind of going to read a little bit, talk about it, read a bit, talk about it as we work our way through this chapter in what is the last in our series on the life of David. Um, so let me pray as we come to hear God's word. Father, we want to just simply still ourselves before you. We thank you for the gift of being able to speak to you, that we have spoken out our praise to you in song. We've spoken out our prayers to you as we've interceded for youth camp and holiday Bible club. Now we want to quieten our hearts and ask that you would speak to us as we read your word. The voice of Yahweh, the living God, speaking to us. So we ask for the help of your spirit, ask for clarity, ask that you would be made big in our minds, our imaginations, and that, Lord, you would strengthen us through these few moments we spend in your word. Amen. Well, I don't know whether you've ever had a season in your life where you've had absolutely no idea what God is doing. Uh, as you look back, you think, you know, you might have been looking for guidance for the future. Uh, perhaps you've been facing opposition, whether in your workplace or in school. Perhaps you've been experiencing relationship difficulties. And you just wonder, what on earth is God doing? And uh, perhaps... For some of us who are a little bit older, we look back and we go, oh, do you know what? I've known a number of those in my life. Uh, perhaps you're just st starting out in following uh, Jesus, and you can just begin to see some of those kind of periods in your discipleship. Or perhaps you're in one of those at the moment, and you go, Jackie, got absolutely no idea what God is saying to me, what he is doing. And it's not that God is absent, that's a different feeling, a different experience. It's just simply that we become bemused at what is happening. Um, you know, we wish perhaps God was just a little bit more obvious. I've had those seasons where I've just felt like, God, if you could just have some flashing lights. You know how planes come into land and the kind of runway is lit up. And you almost want to go, God, could we not have that for a while? No, flashing lights. This is the way to go, Jackie. Just do this. And in the meantime, in those experiences, what do we do? Well, we should be being faithful, obedient. We act rightly. We do what God has asked us to do. And then perhaps it's only with time that we get to look back and go, ah, light bulb moment. That's how God answered those prayers. That's what God was doing. That's how those circumstances fitted together. And I have a sneaky suspicion that the longer we live and the more we follow Jesus, uh, the more we have those seasons, the more we begin to be able to, to do that. And that then kind of strengthens us in the present. But for those of us who can look back and see those, I wonder how we tell those stories. I wonder how they form part of our, our testimony, whether we gloss over them, whether we minimise them, or whether we kind of subtract them to a few words. Well, in 2 Samuel 22, we are reaching the end of David's life, and we're having him tell his story. And we've looked parts of the story as a six o'clock congregation over the past couple of months. And we've seen uh, losses, we've seen opposition, we've seen blessings, we've seen deliverance, we've seen huge mistakes, we've seen restoration, we've seen kindness amongst other things. And as for those of us who have been around for the series, as we look back over those experiences, I wonder how we would graph them together in a kind of closing summary what we might expect to find in this chapter. And what we have here in chapter 21, 22 sorry, is 51 verses. 
of David's testimony, of David's story. It's paralleled in Psalm 18. And in the, you might expect David to pen words that have him as the great and powerful king, that you'd expect him to be the focus of the story. And yet instead, we are going to hear of a great and powerful God. And I think it is a timely reminder, a timely example of who the hero of all our stories are, particularly in an age of celebrity. It actually isn't about us. The hero of our stories is the God that we follow. And the way that David looks back over certain events in his life and sees the hand of God also helps him stand in the present. It enables him to trust God in the now. And therefore, the way that we look at our stories in Christ in the past will enable us to see him at work now and will determine how we live now. So very simply, we're going to approach this chapter in our few moments together through two lens. We're going to think about hindsight and foresight, or to be more specific, grateful hindsight and confident foresight. So hindsight and foresight. So let's dig into the text. And simply tonight, I'm going to read quite a lot of text, make a few comments, and then we'll read a bit more and make a few comments and try and weave out some application uh, as we go. So um, as I read verses 1 to 20, um, just listen out. How, how, what strikes you about what David is saying? So page 328 in the Church Bibles, uh, 2 Samuel 22. David sang to the Lord the words of this song when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge and my saviour. From violent people you save me. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise and have been saved from my enemies. The waves of death swirled around me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I called out to my God from his temple. He heard my voice. My cry came to his ears. The earth trembled and quaked. The foundations of the earth shook. They trembled because he was angry. Smoke rose from his nostrils. Consuming fire came from his mouth. Burning coals blazed out of it. He parted the heavens and came down. Dark clouds were under his feet. He mounted the cherubim and flew. He soared on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his canopy around him, the dark rain clouds of the sky. Out of the brightness of his presence, bolts of lightning blazed forth. The Lord thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High resounded. He shot his arrows and scattered the enemy. With great bolts of lightning, he routed them. The valleys of the sea were exposed and the foundations of the earth laid bare. At the rebuke of the Lord, at the, last, the blast of his breath from his nostrils. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Well, our first element of grateful hindsight is exuberant praise, I think, exuberant praise. Uh, I don't know how you felt as, uh, as you read through that with me. Uh, to me, it's like a, the words are like a machine gun. You know, they pile up a description. It is passionate. It is intense. It is exuberant. You know, David is in extreme distress, and he records that in verses 5 to 7. 
He's thinking back to the encounters he had with Saul and his enemies. And he talks about death traps and snares and anguish on torrents and destruction. It's like death has dogged his steps. Uh, In 1 Samuel 20, he cries out, There is but one step between me and death. And what do you do when you're in that kind of experience? But what David does is call out to his God, verse 7. I called to the Lord. I called out to my God. My cry came to his ears. And I think, in one sense, that's a summary of what we have in a lot of the rest of the Psalms, which are just the expression of David lamenting and crying out to his God. Why does he have confidence to cry out to his God? Because he knows who God is. Look back at verses 1 and 2 particularly. Do you see the names of God, what God is building up and coming out of David's mouth? Rock, fortress, deliverer, shield, horn, refuge, saviour. This is who you are, God. This is how you have acted towards me. Now, the language is poetic. I think I passed my English back in school a long, long, long time ago. But I never really got the hang of poetry. Sorry, uh, English buffs out there. Um, You know, trying to write an essay on what a poem was about and what it was mean. Anyway, but this is poetry. This is graphic. It kind of, (coughs) in one way, is describing God, similar to what you might find in Exodus when uh, Moses encounters God on Mount Sinai. Uh, But actually, this is not what happened historically. If you look in 1 Samuel uh, 18, 19, 23, those kind of chapters, and see some of the events in David's life, they're actually really matter of fact. It describes how he eluded Saul's spear when Saul, in a rage, threw his spear at him. It describes how uh, Saul tries to kill him, or Saul is pursuing him. And given the historic descriptions we have in uh, the rest of the book, David could have simply got to the end of his life and said, Yahweh intervened. Two words. Shorter memory verse. Be a lot easier to recall. Factually accurate. Instead, actually in the Hebrew, I don't actually count up the number of words in the English version here, in the Hebrew, he takes 69 words to describe what factually is true. But you see, David didn't merely want to describe to his readers what was factually true. He wanted to say, see God. See God. The poetry is supposed to fire our imaginations and capture our hearts. This is an awesome God he knows. This is the God who is sovereign over creation. This is the God who is terrifying in power. This is the God who has acted against the enemy. This is the God who rescues and then brings him to a spacious place. Verse 20. And again, what beautiful imagery that is. I don't imagine it's necessarily a literal spacious place, but it's meant to do something to the spirit. I am one of those people that delights in breathing the vast space of open beaches. I don't know if any of you are like that. There is something that just does good to myself when I can stand on a beach and I can't see people and I can't see the heavens and it just fills my lungs with that sense of being in a spacious place and I can feel suffocated in a crowded room. And I think this is that sense of what David's saying, not necessarily literally being in a field somewhere which is just spacious, but actually there's something in his spirit that is experiencing this. His exuberant praise for who God is and how God has acted towards him. Now, as we look back on our lives, uh, there may not be any or as many uh, hostile experiences or snares of death for us uh, to have experienced. But in a real 
in it, you can look around for a moment. I imagine amongst us, we have experienced confusion and distress and disappointment and bemusement and anxiety. The sources of some of those may be external. They may be internal. And I wonder if we put them on a timeline of our life and then look back on them, what we'd notice about our first reaction when some of those things have occurred. You know, do I cry out to God the way David did? I think for me, uh, as I prepped this, one of the biggest challenges of these first 20 verses is, Jackie, is your God as big as David's God? And I ask you, is your God as big as David's God? In the face of trouble, do I, do you, instinctively do verse 7? Or do I kind of go, right, option one, uh, try and sort it out for myself. Okay, that's not one going very well, so what do we do? Option two, wait until all other avenues have failed, and then perhaps eventually call out to God. You see, there can be a gap between what I know in my head about who God is, as David describes him, and actually what I do. But as we look and see what David does, and see how God works in his storyline, hindsight should make me a poet. Hindsight should make you a poet. Because we can all say more than God intervened because it is this God that has worked in our life. It is the God who is the rock, the fortress, the deliverer, the shield. It is Jesus who fulfills all these descriptions in the way he acts towards you and me and brings us to those spacious places. And that should stir exuberant praise. Isn't it great that our praise is not stirred by a tune or the size of a band, but our praise is stirred because of the one that we sing to and the one we can sing about. So second bit of hindsight, Uh, let's read 21 to 31. And uh, this I've entitled Extreme Righteousness. So we've gone from Uh, exuberant praise now into extreme righteousness. See what you make of these verses. David continues, the Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. I am not guilty of turning from my God. All my laws are before me, or his laws, sorry, are before me. I have not turned away from his decrees. I have been blameless before him and have kept myself from sin. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness, he in his sight. To the faithful, you show yourself faithful. To the blameless, you show yourself blameless. To the pure, you show yourself pure. But to the devious, you show yourself shrewd. You save the humble, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them low. You, Lord, are my lamp. The Lord turns my darkness into light. With your help, I can advance against troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. So, question for those who've been around for the past couple of weeks. How do you hear this section in the last of our last couple of sermons. What have we most recently looked at in David's life? A couple of weeks ago. Nick preached on it for us. What did we look at? What were oops, major failure on David's? David and Bathsheba, yeah, major sin and failure. Not only do you commit adultery, David, you go there and try and cover it up by murdering her husband, and dot, dot, dot. Um, So how do we read these words in line with what we have discovered about David? You know, is David having a senior moment 
He's at the end of his life, and he's just forgetting parts of his life. It's like, you know, no, no, I can't even remember that bit. Bathsheba, Bathsheba who? What, what was going on then? Uh, or is he having that kind of airbrushing out the behavior that's rather inconvenient and doesn't fit with his role as king? You know, party, what parties? We didn't hold any parties. They're yeah, rather inconvenient to confess to parties. Uh, is that what's going on? Well, no. Uh, to both of those possibilities. I think David here, at the end of his life, is speaking of the general trajectory of his life. It's a strap line that would go over it. He's not speaking of specifics or details. He knows that he penned Psalm 51 that we've looked at. He knows that he penned Psalm 32, where in verses 3 and 4 he talks about his bones wasting away when he kept silent about sin and that God's hand was heavy on him until he confessed and God forgave him his guilt. He is not reverting to self-righteousness or works. He's not saying, I don't need God's mercy. He's not claiming perfection, but he is saying, as he gets to the end of his life, this has been my life's direction. It has been one of integrity of wholeness, of completeness. I have sought to live God's ways, even in difficulties. And therefore, as he's getting to the end of his life, he is able to say that he has been faithful, that he has been blameless, that he has been pure, that he has kept himself from sin. Because he has not turned from God, he is finishing his life trusting in Yahweh. Uh, The theologian of a number of centuries ago, John Calvin, wrote of this. David sometimes fell into sin through the weakness of the flesh, but never desisted in following after godliness, nor deserted the service which God had called him to. David sometimes fell into sin through weakness of flesh, but never desisted in following after godliness, nor deserted the service which God had called him to. I quite like that as a strap line over my life, I think. Jackie sometimes fell into sin. Well, no surprise there. Through weakness of flesh, but never desisted in following after godliness, nor deserted the service which God had called her to. Do you like that over your life? Is that a strap line that's worth pursuing? We will sin. We will fail. And we are grateful that we have a greater king now than David, one who actually fulfilled this, not in just in the general terms, but in all the specifics, and never sinned, and who has given us his righteousness. So, two applications to meditate on, to take into the week. Firstly, am I, are you living from the place of knowing that we have been declared righteous in Christ? Christ has fulfilled all of this, and we are in Christ. And therefore, we do not need to be entangled by shame or regret. That inner voice that may come and condemn us. Are we in a situation where I actually go, Jackie, I don't know that I can take this as a general over my life because I'm too aware of the specifics. Well, that may be so. But scripture speaks to the fact that God takes our sin and as far as the east is from the west, separates it from us. He hurls it into the sea and places that kind of no fishing sign over it. He has declared you righteous, and therefore be faithful, be blameless, be pure. And then I think simply the question is, is this trajectory ours? Though we still sin, is our love and loyalty to God seen in our continued obedience? Wherever he has placed us, at school, in a non-Christian home, in a workplace, wherever it may be. Well, let's finish our last section, verses 32 onwards, and we're going to move from hindsight to foresight, 
I'm going to read the chapter, and this is our expectant hope. Expectant hope. For who is God besides the Lord, and who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He causes me to stand on the heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You make your saving help my shield. Your help has made me great. You provide a broad path for my feet so that my ankles do not give way. I pursued my enemies and crushed them. I did not turn back till they were destroyed. I crushed them completely and they could not rise. They fell beneath my feet. You armed them with strength for battle, armed me with strength for battle. You humbled my adversaries before me. You made my enemies turn their backs in flight and I destroyed my foes. They cried for help, but there was no one to save them to the Lord, but he did not answer. I beat them as fine as the dust of the earth. I pounded and trampled them like the mud in the streets. You have delivered me from the attacks of the peoples. You have preserved me as the head of nations. People I do not know now serve me. Foreigners cower before me. As soon as they hear of me, they obey me. They all lose heart. They come trembling from their stronghold. The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be my God, the rock, my saviour. He is the God who avenges me, who puts the nations under me, who sets me free from my enemies. You exalted me above my foes from a violent man. You rescued me. Therefore, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing the praises of your name. He gives his king great victory. He shows unfailing kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Did you notice, as we read through, and keep your eyes back on the passage, the wonderful mix of I statements and you or he statements in this. It's just kind of meshed together. In one breath, David is saying, I did this. And in another moment, he's saying, God has done this. There is just such a clear ownership by David that everything is under God's power. So in verses 32 to 43, we have his, his victories being described. And David says, I pursued, I didn't turn back, I crushed. And then he'll also say, but you acted, you humble, you made. You see, the kingdom was not established by David's action, but by God's power and promises. He then, in verses 44 to 46, describes his rule as king. And then from 40, verse 47, his exaltation as king. And all the way through, he's testifying to what God has done to establish the kingdom. David has stepped into what God is doing. David, though, has not been inactive. It hasn't just been a case that David was able to sit back and go, I let go, I let your way. He actually had to go out and pursue the enemies. And we followed and traced that through in the series. But having acted, David does not put himself at the center of the story and said, it was my brilliance. I was a great king. You know, what I learned as a shepherd boy, I killed that, I did that. It all prepared me so well. It's all about me. No, he goes, yes, I was doing this and I had to do that. But it was all about God. It was all about God. It is his establishing the kingdom. And that gives him hope beyond the grave, verse 51, because he will show unfailing kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. There is a king coming, a greater king, who will bring about the victory over death, who will supremely reign over all nations, not just one nations, who will be exalted to the highest place, not just exalted over one kingdom. See, brothers and sisters, all the way through, God's unfailing kindness is seen to the king, to David, and then to Christ, and to his people. There's lots that could be said, but I'm anticipating ice cream now. But it's a stunning testimony, isn't it? It's a stunning testimony. It's 
a story that we can place ourselves within. We can look back and trace his power at work in us. As believers, it's important to have a good memory. But it's important to have the right memory as we look at our storyline. And because we can look back and say, this is how God has acted, this is who God is, we can be confident today that God will be working his power. But it also means that we can be confident for the future. So if this was David's heartfelt testimony at the end of his life, may our heartfelt testimony at this point in our lives be as passionate as David's, rooted in all we know in Christ, the greater him. Let's pray. Father, um, you know our hearts, you know what's going on uh, in our circumstances at the moment. Uh, You know those of us who are actually crying out to you, God, what are you doing? Where am I to go? What am I to do? You know those of us who are perhaps hesitant to be turning to you in our distress and crying out, we pray that you would loosen our lips. For those of us who are looking back and going, Oh, I'm so grateful for answered prayer. We want to pray that you would strengthen our praise, that we wouldn't be merely those who go, yeah, God intervened, but you would make us poets. You'd make us those who praise you. You'd make us those who realise the depths of your character and who you are and how you have acted. We pray that these are the stories that we might tell one another as a community, that we might strengthen one another's vision of who you are Father, we pray that as a congregation, our God might be as big as David's God. And we thank you that we, in fact, in one sense, can see more because we are this side of the cross and we know Christ. David looked forward to that coming of another king. We look back and go, his name is Jesus, and he is wonderful. And so we want to pray that we would follow you. Enable us, we pray, to walk well not to desist in serving you and to keep growing in godliness. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue to respond in praise as we bring our service to a close. Uh, There'll be an opportunity for prayer. If there's anything you'd like to pray with somebody through, just if you move that direction, others will move in that direction to pray for you. But let's stand. Should we stand? Let's stand and sing.
darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt
as we go into the week ahead. We thank you there is not one moment of our week where you will not be present. There is not one moment of our week where you will not say Lord over it. And therefore we pray as your people, we might praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, throughout the week ahead. Amen. Amen. That draws this part of our time together to a close opportunity to receive prayer if you'd like that and ah natalie's already left the room so that suggests natalie and sophie have gone ice cream and cake will be making their way into the room any moment so do stay around talk to new people enjoy and uh, have a great week <laughs>